so for the few of you that have not seen Mr. Robot, um, it's sort of a dystopian hacker suspense thriller show. And um, part of why it's gotten so much attention is because the tech is, uh, it's pretty accurate and also it's kind of true to hacker culture. So people watch it, I think a lot of people watch it to see tools that they know. Um, and I watch it so I can learn about the tools that are being used. So I invite hackers over and <laughs> like ask them a bunch of questions. Um, you know, we'll pause a lot and kind of review stuff. So um, uh, that's kind of what I've been doing. And then um, uh, I do a, a, when the seasons are on, I just got a group of hackers together and we would do like chats over Semaphore and just kind of talk about what we saw happening and what they got right and didn't get right. Um, this is me dressing up as Mr. Robot at a party. Nobody had any idea who we were. It was really funny. <laughs> um, so a lot of people who watch Mr. Robot who are really into tech will kind of nitpick uh, all the details. And they'll be like, well, this one thing I would have done differently. Why wasn't there a rapper script? You know? um, and so I always kind of remind them like what we're, looking, what we're comparing it to. The bar isn't exactly set high. <laughs> um, and I, for a while I was trying to write this column for Wired where they were like, look at other hacking shows and interview experts about whether what happened on the show was real and like nobody wanted to talk to me. Nobody wanted to be quoted about like, the tech in Quantico is bullshit, you know, or whatever. Um, but everything is pretty much laughably inaccurate in these shows. There's like, all the malware is red for some reason, like, it's just weird, it's just weird stuff. Um, and sometimes people think you're kind of being elitist when you point it out, but it's actually pretty problematic because um, of the way entertainment sort of filters into our culture and like all the digital illiteracy that kind of transfers over into like normal conversation with people who are not <coughs> tech savvy, um, like believe some of the stuff they see in these awful shows. <laughs> so, well, Hackers was a good movie. Um, but that said, there are, I think, some things that Mr. Robo got wrong, especially in their pilot episode. Um, so basically, um, Elliot somehow was able to trace an IP address to a Tor hidden service. Um, they kind of conflated Tor browser, you know, and just using Tor with a hidden service in the pilot. And a lot of people were really upset about it. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who watched it critically, there were some weird IP addresses. Um, there was some weird stuff going on with the Linux prompt. Um, and so I actually interviewed their, um, one of their tech guys, and he told me that like for the pilot episode, they had a tech, they had like a tech consultant, but he wasn't there every day, and the animator <coughs> did not like coordinate with the tech consultant. Um, they just gave him like a packet of printouts of commands and outputs and told him to like animate it. And he'd never worked with Linux in his life or seen it or anything, and just kind of had to make something of it. But even with that, it's still more accurate than other shows, which is kind of cool. Um, but they did iterate and get better. So this is Cordana. He's the he's a uh, writer and tech producer on the show, and he has he's basically in charge of that. He works with this team of consultants listed here, um, and they like test out any hacks that'll fit in the story. And if they won't work, they'll like change the story or change the hacks until it kind of all fits in really smoothly. Um, and then they like spend a lot of time figuring out. Like, what does the screen look like when we do this? How do the characters interact with the software? Like, what hardware do they use? What are we paying attention to? So it's not just the tools, it's also, like, the plot lines. Um, and one of the things we did when we were doing our chat and talking about Mr. Robot is we talked about the terrible OPSEC that a lot of the characters had, and it all kind of came back to them at the end. Um, and then just things that should work that didn't work, and just all the stuff that kind of happens. Like, it's all kind of part of what the show gets right, which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, the tools, um, like some of them have to, they use a lot of tools that are out there. Like for example, they actually cut and paste some stuff on Tor on using Debian. But um, some of the tools that they use, they've had to kind of make <coughs> their own versions of them for legal reasons. Um, because like they don't want to, uh, so, like, if you contact a company and tell them, like, oh, we want to own your smartphone, <laughs> like, like, you know, um, it's just easier to kind of make a pretend version that, like, is their own tool, but it's actually this other tool. 
and they'll like change a few things here and there, but people are so on top of it on Reddit and just everywhere, kind of reverse engineering and figuring out what the tools actually are based on. Um, so some of the tools that I'm going to go over that I'm saying that they use, like they haven't explicitly said it's that tool, um, but you, they, it kind of is, you kind of know. <laughs> so um, uh, so I would, uh, Tor, they've gotten a lot better at um, featuring Tor on the show since that pilot episode. Um, there was one episode where they had to set up a brand new web host anonymously, so Elliot SSH did over Tor, and there was instructions that was basically copied from here. They even used the Tor, we checked the fingerprint, the PGP fingerprint, and they used the current Tor signing fingerprint. Um, they started setting up Onion services, using Scallion to brute force Onion addresses, and just got really sophisticated in covering Tor. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, Kali Linux is another tool they use. Um, it's uh, the successor to Backtrack, and it's the De Debian-based version of Linux that's built specifically for pen testing and auditing, and it's used in a lot of episodes. Uh, and I really like this one because it's free and it's open source. Um, it's pre-installed with a lot of different programs that they end up using. Um, you can crack Wi-Fi passwords, you can bypass antivirus software. Um, and so obviously it's set up to test security vulnerabilities on your own network, but on the show they're, you know, using it for other nefarious purposes. Um, so that is, it's, I remember when that first came on and everybody was so excited, I'm like, oh my god, Kelly Linux is on our show, this is so cool. Um, Metasploit, I think this was in the first season, they used Metasploit, uh, Rapid7's Metasploit framework, um, which is an exploit development and delivery system. Um, and it lets you create and execute exploits again for pen testing, but it saves you a lot of time because you don't have to learn a new tool each time you want to run an exploit. And I think they use Metripreter, which is one of the payloads that can be used within Metasploit. Um, it resides in the memory and writes nothing to disk, but it can, if you're an attacker, it can give you control of the target system and parts of the network. And it's often used within Kali Linux, or you can use it um, you can use it within Kali Linux if you have a VM running in Windows, or you can just run it on Windows, depending on your setup. Um, uh, this is the social engineer toolkit. Uh, there's a lot of social engineering on the show. It's pretty interesting. Uh, just the easiest way to kind of get passwords and bypass stuff with social engineering. Obviously, people are your weakest link, so they do a lot of just... Um, there was an episode where Elliot just randomly called someone and pretended, I think he pretended he was their bank or something, and was like, oh, I just need your birth date and your social security number. People will just give you information. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, but Social Engineer Toolkit is, uh, again, it's open source, pen testing framework, um, designed to simulate social engineering attacks. Everything from like, phishing, spear phishing, um, harvesting credentials. And Elliot actually used his own, he used like an older module that's no longer available. Um, but you can still add that package in, like it's in an older version, and so he added it back in, I guess. Um, and he used the SMS spoofing <coughs> from within um, the social engineer toolkit. It's kind of cool. Uh, John the Ripper. Um, so it John the Ripper detects like crappy Unix password. Um, it can. I, I, don't, I always tell people like your password is terrible when you try to talk to people about how their password is awful and. It's not any better because they changed the O's to zeros. <laughs> um, so if you tell them, like, you know, there's tools that can crack, like, they can have several thousand or millions of attempts per second. This is one of them, um, and you can use it again within the Kali Linux framework. Um, and I think he used it to crack somebody's password um, early in the season. Okay, so this is a really creepy one. They actually emailed me because I included them in a, a tool roundup I wrote, and I'm like, please don't ever email me again. Because <laughs> this tool really creeps me out. It's uh, It was used in the first season by Tyrell Wellick, who's like one of the bad guys sort of in the show. Um, he secretly installs it on, on somebody's Android phone. It's like a mobile monitoring software on your cell phone, and it gains root privilege by using SuperSu. Or, I'm sorry, you gain root privilege by using SuperSue and then install it, but it'll hide SuperSue as part of the installation, so it's really sneaky. Um, and it's funny how they try to advertise it, because they'll say, like, oh yes, this is for 
your work phone when you're monitoring your employees and they're aware of it. And I'm like, well, why do you have to hide the trace of it then? Um, so this is a creepy tool that's out there. It does not um, recover any past data, but it can show you anything still stored on your phone's memory or your target's phone's memory um, or SIM card and then anything happening in the future. So yeah, that's a creepy, scary one. <laughs> Um, I thought this one was really cool, uh, Deep Sound. Um, so it was in one episode in the very first season, and Elliot had fried his computer's memory chip in the microwave. Uh, there's actually a really funny Def Con talk called How I Lost My Other Eye, which goes over all the different ways to try to destroy things um, that I would recommend looking at. I just love that talk. But anyway, he basically... Um, fried his computer's memory chip in the microwave. So then it was really counterintuitive because he was storing evidence of everybody he hacked on CD-ROMs disguised as CDs. And I'm like, why would he do that? Like, he's like a smart guy, and, like he has good OPSEC. Um, but he actually was using this tool, Deep Sound. It's an audio converter tool that like hides files in plain sight. So it's an example of steganography, um, just hiding, you know, the art of hiding something in plain sight. Um, and it converts all these files into WAVE and FLAC files, and they're encrypted and password protected. So he's got a CD with actual songs on it as labeled, and then he's hiding these files within it. Um, and I thought that was really cool. Um, you can extract secret files directly from the audio files or CD tracks. And I think this is also free and open source. Um, oh yeah, this is like a real example of steganography. There's a messaging app they use. So like as we were watching this show, we would get very disappointed when characters we like use tools that we didn't like. We're like, why are they using this? And Wicker, for me, is like one of the tools I personally don't like. They bother me. And part of the reason why is because they had this um, big marketing campaign for this thing they call, it was some kind of cat thing that they called steganography. So basically what you would do is uh, you would share photos with people. And if they weren't on your friends list, they would see cat photos. Um, and if they were on your friends list, they'd also see cat photos, but they could click through and see a secret message. And they called it steganography, but it's not steganography because there was nothing hidden within the cat messages. And I'm like, how are you co-opting this technical term um, to, for marketing reasons? So I really didn't like Wicker. Um, and I was really happy. Oh yeah, they're also not open source, they're proprietary, and they have kind of sketchy, in my opinion, marketing. Like they'll say things like military grade crypto that's strong enough to crack governments. And, I'm like, oh, I don't like you. And I was really bummed that they weren't using Signal. Um, so I was just talking to uh, Hans earlier about how as the shows evolved, these tools have evolved as well. Um, and uh, at the time, Wicker would let you, it had like an auto-delete feature where you could send messages and they would disappear within a certain amount of time. And Signal did not have that at the time, but they do have disappearing messages now. Um, so I like to think that if, if Signal had disappearing messages, then sure, probably would have used the open source version of this tool <laughs> that doesn't pretend they're stego when they're not. Um, but yeah, these are two messaging apps that were used on the show. Um, I don't know how well, like there was a time when they used Signal for a phone call, and there's, um, they'll give you a key, so there will be two words, uh, and you're supposed to read one word, and then the person you're speaking to is supposed to read the other word, um, because it makes it harder, it's still possible that it makes it harder for somebody to intercept that call, um, or to man in the middle of that call, though you can still do it. I think Joseph Bonneau at EFF showed how you could still do it, but obviously your level of skill would have to be Signals word pairs are, are given so that you can uh, de detect man in the middle. Yes, yeah, so you can detect man there. in the middle. But Joe, I, I remember reading something that was really technical about how it could still be man in the middle. But obviously, you'd have to be like have incredible resources to be able to do it. Um, but yeah, anyway, they made this call and they didn't read their words, which is really disappointing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's messaging apps. Um, and then another tool that Elliot used was ProtonMail, another one that I was upset that he used. Um, it was in episode 8 of the first season, and I was hoping he'd use like Pond or something cooler than ProtonMail. Um, ProtonMail is end-to-end -end encrypted, um, but they don't actually protect the endpoints, and there's a few issues with it, one being that their use of um, JavaScript 
Uh, okay, so let me talk about the good parts too. The good part about ProtonMail <coughs> is that it does have two passwords. So your login password gets sent to the server, and that's how you prove that the username you're using for the email is actually yours. And then the second password, they say never gets sent to their server, and that runs in your browser and decrypts your messages. Um, and then ProtonMail stores your email encrypted to disk, which is pretty cool because it's like undecipherable if a government agency compels the company to hand over your communications. But the bad part is that they can, they because it's, they can actively attack and steal the password if they wanted to. Uh, and it's not easy to know whether a message you're sending to another ProtonMail user is being encrypted to their current public key because it's over their IRC server. Um, so Alice sends a message to Bob, encrypted with his public key, they're good. But ProtonMail can give Alice its own keys in addition to Bob's keys, uh, and that would allow them to eavesdrop. That's kind of prob a problem with the um, keep happening. Yeah. Uh, like that screen saver. Yeah. Mm. So I just need to keep hitting them. Press shift every time. Huh? Just press shift every once in a while. Okay. There it goes. <coughs> with iMessage, you can't verify keys. Uh, I think it's still a problem with WhatsApp. It used to not be as much of a problem with Signal, but they just changed their fingerprint structure and it hasn't looked into it closely yet. Um, they can also serve malicious code to say an IP address because there is JavaScript. It's the same problem that there's been with other similar services. Um, though I think they have a, a, like a native program now that you can use, which does not have that problem. Um, so, but I, when it came out, I was like really bummed because they didn't have that yet. It was just all email, and I'm like, you know, why would he use ProtonMail? It's just bad. Um, and there's some legal issues too, and I feel like the company was sort of misleading <laughs> when they talk about it because they're like, we're in Switzerland and nobody can access our information, but. Um, Switzerland has a mutual legal assistance treaty with the U.S., so it, they actually can get information, or legally they're allowed to get the same information that you would have to turn over to the U.S. Court. It's just as time consuming and takes a lot of time. Uh, so, I don't know, Proton Mail. I would rather see Elliot use GPG from command line. Um, or if, he's, <laughs> <laughs> if you're less geeky, you can use Thunderbird and Enigma or Mail, mail Below. The other thing about Proton Mail is that everybody has to use it. Like, it has to be used on both ends, but that's kind of true about a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, that was one of the ones that he used, and I was really bummed about. Um, RSA Secure ID, I really like this, because everybody I know who saw that episode, um, I could talk to about two-factor authentication. So basically what happened was, um, Elliot was trying to get into his boss's computer when he was working at Allsafe. So what he did was, he sent his boss a lar large MMS files to drain his phone's battery. Then his boss like charged his phone in his office, just left it there so he could snag a phone. And then he had to enter the code. So you guys know, and I'm sure everybody here knows what 2FA is. You, it's a way to prevent people from owning your account. Usually it's like a, either a text message code or a YubiKey or an app on your phone. It just adds an additional layer of security because not only do you have to enter your PIN or password, but you also have to enter this one-time password, which he was able to do because he got the phone just in time got the RSA secure ID, entered it in the end of the password, and boom, we <laughs> used Goldman. But it's cool because I can tell people like, oh, if he hadn't been able to access that phone, he wouldn't have been able to hack in, so it really decreases your, um, your risk. Um, so that's RSA. Anybody know what this is? Um, this is the Pwn phone that they used. Uh, Elliot used it to crack. Uh, he used Cracksim, which was a script that he'd written to crack uh, DES encryption of a SIM card so he could get a bunch of contacts that he needed. Um, this is built on Kali Linux. It has a lot of built-in tools uh, if you can't write your own scripts or don't want to like Elliot did. Um, and it's cool because you, can, you don't usually, it's harder usually to get a normal laptop to get into cellular hardware. Um, you can take a laptop and boot to Kali and then start hacking Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but it takes a lot of custom work if you want to hack, you know, GSM, CDMA, some of these other things. So you can use this very expensive phone. <laughs> I think it might also be better for like war walking type stuff because it's like less <coughs> conspicuous walking around with your phone than you are like 
yeah, with all your boxes. So that's that. Uh, this is a rubber ducky. <laughs> um, this was used by a character to, um, she logged into, she, she was trying to get passwords. They've actually done a lot with USB drives, which is pretty interesting. There was one episode where um, Darlene kind of threw random USB drives on the ground and somebody picked it up. I think it was a police officer who picked it up and his antivirus software sadly caught, caught it. Um, and Elliot's like, what are you, a script kitty? Because it was just like some script she downloaded and put on drives. But it's like, I forget the exact number, but they've shown that like 76% of people who find random USBs will just plug it into their machine. Um, another bad thing that can happen is this rubber ducky. You can use it. She used it to extract credentials from uh, Windows Security Account Manager registry, um, which got hashes that she could crack using some of the other tools I talked about. Um, and they think it had um, a program called Mimikatz, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which will dump passwords stored in memory. Um, so you just plug this into your target's uh, computer and boom, passwords. Um, this one's really cool because I like Bishop Fox, they're local. <laughs> uh, they help sponsor CactusCon. I was excited about this one. Um, this is a tool that they use to help you steal badge information. It's a long-range radio frequency reader called the Tastic RFID Thief. Um, and it'll save information on a micro SD card uh, as a text file so you can clone the badge. Um, it's portable. It's not that big. You can sneak it into your messenger bag or briefcase or whatever. Um, and obviously, it's used for pen testing and other reasons on this show, too. Um, Okay, this is the mag spoof. So I was kind of confused when I was researching this about whether it would work or not, because the guy who created it, uh, Sammy, he's like a genius, um, really smart. Um, he said that you can't, well, okay, let me tell you what it does first. So it's a device that can spoof or emulate magnetic strips on credit cards, and it can work wirelessly. Um, it basically generates an electromagnetic field that emulates a traditional magnetic strip card. You can build it in Arduino. Um, and in the show, Darlene used it to clone a maze key at a hotel. Um, but I, I think that he said you can't actually use it to um, steal and run credit cards. Um, so that's something I need to look into more. But, um, but yeah, she basically asked for more towels, like clone this key, and then she had her <coughs> hotel key. So I don't know if that would work or not, but I think it, it would. I just had to research it more. Um, this is a, obviously a Raspberry Pi. Um, they used it in the show to gain remote access to HVAC systems to raise the temperature in a storage room where there was tape backups stored um, because they wanted to destroy the records of consumer debt. Um, and it's just kind of cool. It would be hilarious if that happened in real life and it was just a tiny little Raspberry Pi <laughs> you know, that was doing that. Um, so that was cool. Um, so I talked a little about how it's not just the tools they use, but like the whole culture and processes. And there was an episode here where they were trying to f hack somebody who, <laughs> who was tied to a pole, and they were like, how do we get into her account? Um, and the first thing they did was uh, they used offline NT password to reset her encryption. And then they tried to run some kind of forensics on her phone. Um, and they used a Linux Live CD to try to get past Windows. And then they found a password on her fridge, on a sticky note on her fridge. And I just thought that was hilarious. It's just the funniest thing to me. Because that would totally ha Like, I had, um, I got my house broken into once. And the guy cut a hole through the screen in my back door and tried to unlock it, which didn't work. But I had, like, stupidly left my keys in the front door. So he just <laughs> got in that way. It just reminds me of that. Like, people totally put their passwords on sticky notes on their fridge. And then um, they recovered her Gmail password because they had her Hotmail password. Um, they set up a vacation autoresponder for her to, like, make sure people weren't worried about what had happened to her. Um, I don't know, it's just kind of a funny little story. Um, and then another funny story. So I think it's really interesting, especially when you look at activist groups, how they're really good on OPSEC in some areas and completely oblivious in other areas. Um, so like you would throw an end of the world party at your headquarters and put the address up everywhere and you're you know, 
DJ name would be the same as your real name or like very easily traceable to your real name. Um, but then you would like smash people's phone because they posted something on social media. Um, and there was an episode, or there was a, something really funny that happened in one episode was when um, somebody wanted to meet, uh, this character Cisco wanted to meet Darlene, but he wanted to make sure that she wasn't being tailed. So he had people put on F Society masks to steal her phone uh, to make sure she wasn't being tracked like when she met him. And I just thought that was really, really funny. Um, at least they're thinking about it, I guess. <laughs> they had such bad OPSEC in most of the season. Um, there's, so I can't get to every tool. There's so many tools. Um, there was like a really cool smart home hack, which I think could totally happen. There was a lot going on with Bitcoin and like stolen Bitcoin. Um, there was some ransomware stuff. There were burner phones. There was like, I remember like every time there was like a flash on a screen of a tool, people were like, oh, I recognize that. That's an IRC client from the 90s I used to use. Or like um, HTTPS Everywhere was used, which is um, a uh, browser, ta or what do you call it, a tool that was created by EFF that'll basically, if the site you're on offers HTTPS, it'll go to HTTPS. So somebody saw that and was really excited. Um, there was like a lot of parallels sort of hidden in, um, or like to like Stage Fright and Stuxnet and I don't know, I, I remember like just talking to hackers about it and they were like, they used the shred command, they used Thinwalk, this is so cool. But like, I was like, can you make an antenna out of a Pringles can? <laughs> like, there was just a lot going on um, to look at. So this is just kind of a broad overview. Um, there's a lot of, I, I kind of feel like television is evolving a little bit, not just, um, like I've been watching a lot of shows lately that are really confusing and to understand what's going on, you have to like do research online basically. You have to like go on Reddit and like read these weird theories. Um, and there's just a lot going on in this show. There's a lot of like Easter eggs that are hidden in and just um, layers upon layers upon layers. So I think I could watch it 10 times over and still catch these little details. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this broad overview. Uh, this is me. Send me story ideas. I'm on, I'm on signal. Send me your top secret. <laughs> um, or I'm on PGP, or we can meet in a dark alley and give me your dumps, and I'll write about it. <laughs>